read the R? Yeah. Uh, you can read the, the R. Ah, okay. This is Spanish. I see. Okay. <laughs> okay. So good morning again. We are very happy to have the first part of the mini course by uh, Juan Riviera Lepier and counting periodic orbits of one dimensional maps. Please. All right. Thank you. Um, well, uh, thank you uh, to the organizers for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be back in, um, in Warsaw. And yeah, so I wanted to discuss some um, results on uh, counting really orbits. So we love to count, right? And uh, so the idea is to count uh, some dynamical system, and we want to understand the uh, number of periodic points. So how do they grow? Whether um, they have some additional structure, or uh, whether you can perhaps find a closed formula for them in some cases. Okay, so. Um, Counting garbage. So let's start with a very general uh, situation. Say we have a topological space and some continuous map. And for some number, some integer n, at least one. Can define the number of six points of epilogues. And maybe I'll add um, isolated. So maybe. In uh, certain algebraic situations, you have to get separate these six points, and you want to maybe throw that away, and just count isolated uh, six points. All right, so one of one way of encoding the sequence of uh, uh, the sequence of um, numbers of real points is to uh, build a generating sequence, right? A generating series. Now, uh, there is this uh, series that was proposed by Artin and Maser, which is a slight variant of that. And we will see later that that's in fact natural. So it's not the obvious one that you would perhaps come out uh, with immediately, but it's a slightly better for, um, as we will see perhaps uh, today at some point or uh, even better tomorrow. Okay? All right, so the Artin Mather function is a power series in a complex variable that I will denote by the dot f the exponential of the sum. Over n, one over n, and this number counting the um, isolated fixed points of f of f. Now, uh, not quite the generating factor. Oh, God, I forgot it, of course. And it's not quite the generating function, but it's close to it if you look. At the logarithmic derivative of this function, we do get the generating function up to a factor of s. Um, that's one of the reasons why. We may consider exponential and this one over n 
is so that we have something closer to the uh, Riemann set of function. For example, in this in this case, for, for that formula, we have this Euler type product. Uh, where we can write the um, Arkin Maser set of function as a product over periodic orbits. And I'm going to denote by p hat. And we want to. Um, multiply for each periodic orbit this factor of one over um, one minus s to the prime period of the orbit. So this is the minimal period or prime period. Well, in fact, as a side note, the um, original motivation of Artin and Maser was this uh, local set of function that is the object of was the object of the Bay conjectures, and that's one of the motivations for Grothendieck to and his school to rewrite somehow algebraic geometry. And in fact, if you take the um, so the Artin Maser set of function of uh, uh, the Frobenius morphism of uh, variety over Finite field is precisely this uh, uh, um, this local set of function that was studied by Bay. Okay, whatever. So there was somehow a secret motivation to add the exponent. That's the lesson. All right. So let me perhaps uh, mention a few known facts about this uh, series, and. Um, and then we can focus on the one-dimensional case. In some sense, the uh, only tractable case, uh, in a way. All right, so maybe some known fact. Now, if you think about it, the even the convergence of whether the series has a positive convergence radius is already an issue, right? Uh, it's conceivable that you have plenty of critical point, uh, of critical points, and they grow uh, very fast. And if they grow at least along the subsequence faster than an exponential, the radius of convergence will be zero. So, so that's already uh, a question. Okay. And um, so let's suppose we are in a good situation where x is a manifold. of class and CA where K is stabilized. So the, the first result by Artin and Maser is that uh, there is a dense code for X in a dense subset of Space of deep amorphisms of class PK of X. Um, this set of function has a positive radius of convergence. All right, so at least you can perturb. Uh, any given any diffeomorphism, uh, you can always perturb it in such a way that at least you get some positive radius of convergence. And even in a more positive note, uh, there was this conjecture. Yeah. Is there any C gate topology on the K axis? Uh, dense in the um, CK topology? Yeah. yeah. Is it uh, residual or what you just care about? Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, that's known. Uh, so let, let's keep it positive for, for a minute. So, uh, 
Right, and then there was this conjecture by Snail that uh, for uniformly hyperbolic maps or say more precisely axiom A, um, this function should be rational, and that that was shown by Guggenheimer and uh, Manning independently. So, so for F uniformly hyperbolic. I see for uh, some A. Um, this function is in fact uh, rational in this. Okay, yeah, I see. Okay. All right. So now this is really nice because it, it tells you that um, the coefficient of the this sequence that counts the number of periodic points of period n satisfies a linear recurrence. Uh, in particular, you can, uh, if you look at the associated uh, characteristic polynomial, you can use the roots of that polynomial to find a closed formula for the coefficient. So you can determine precisely uh, the exact amount of um, fixed points of period n. Okay. So this is a really uh, very, very nice situation. Um, so of course, uh, we know by now that these are far from being generic, right? And there's this new house phenomenon. So whenever the dimension is at least three or if we are in dimension two, And k is at least two, so three. So either we are in high dimension or dimension two, but high regularity. It's not that high. So whatever we need for new house phenomenon. Uh, in this situation, we know that generic. So there are generic sets. F to which um, let me write it this way. So the writing makes a set of function uh, diverges. So basically, the radius of, of convergence is zero. Now, this has been shown in a residual of a residual set. So again, what, what do I mean by this? Generic here, basically anything you like. So residual was shown by uh, Kaloshin. Then uh, if you interpret that as prevalent, uh, there's the result by uh, Kaloshin and all of this based on this uh, new house phenomenon. And perhaps more, even more strikingly, um, generic in the sense of uh, Kolmogorov. So full measure for generic families of arbitrary uh, dimension. This is uh, a full measure. And though, of course, we know. It's not the recent result by Virginia. Okay, so the message here is that basically, as soon as you are in dimension two or above, I mean, at least in high, relatively high regularity, uh, things, um, there's nothing really you can expect. Uh, perhaps you could try to expand, say, maybe under 
certain non-uniform hyperbolicity condition, you, you may have a nicer behavior, okay? But at least it seems hard to show uh, something uh, more general than just the dense subset here. It's hard to measure deep. Sorry, so mm -hmm. about, uh, there, when it's a rational function, so you know, in hyperbolic case, can you tell something more about it? How does it depend on f degree? What, what are the coefficients? Or... Uh, yeah, it depends on uh, on f definitely, and uh, well, one way of thinking about this, we will see like a baby, really baby example of this. Uh, but the upshot is that uh, you can use symbolic dynamics to uh, basically um, relate the dynamics or at least the periodic points of f to a Markov chain where you can compute. Um, the number of periodic points exactly by, uh, let's say, iterating the matrix. Yeah. Could you please repeat what is the difference between the Zs result and the Kaloshi hand result? Okay, so this is the um, full measure in the sense of Kolmogorov. So, so okay, prevalent, uh, prevalent here is that you. Um, this is the attempt where, so of course we know, we know that there's no way of. Uh, there's no limit measure in infinite dimensions, right? So one way would be to um, find a replacement, so a measure that is not translation invariant but has nicer properties. This is the prevalent point of view that's collision enhanced. So they basically show that for certain measures um, that pick up infinite dimensions in some sense, and they're natural in some other respects, um, you have that almost every F for that measure, uh, the radius of convergence is zero. Now, Berger's result is in the sense of Kolmogorov, where you look at, say, fix of uh, families with three parameters, say, and you show that for a generic family of three parameters, Almost for almost every parameter in that generic family, uh, you have this bad property. Okay, so so these are two different points of view. So here you keep a finite dimensional space, but you impose it to be generic. Whereas here you go directly to infinite dimension and try to make uh, sense of that. Okay. All right. Okay, any other? Questions of like from now on, it will be one dimension. Just uh, yes, those results they're starting like locally near a uh, well behaved a map with some particular property. Like it's not a it's, it's the new house phenomenon. So you have a, a persistent tangency between two uh, stable and unstable. So once you have that, then locally, right? So uh, I think at least for guess, uh, I think it's formulated in, in a way that, uh, you know, you, you, you are in an, one of these open sets where you have this new house phenomenon, perhaps with a few hypotheses, and then provided that you have that setting, then you do have this uh, full measure result. Yes? But in general, how do you go from this uh, persistent tendencies to your number of periodic points going too fast for that series to go fast? All right, so, um, well, you can look at maybe the um, uh, this residual case. So Kalochin idea was to, um, in fact, modify the map slightly so, so that the tangency, you can make the tangency to be of arbitrary high contact. Okay, so it's, it's not quadratic anymore. You can perturb it in a generic way. So, so, I mean, you, you can find within uh, this new house phenomenon uh, tangencies that are of, say, order at least 10. So there is a very high contact, and with a small perturbation, you can create lots of periodic points. Okay. And um, in fact, Kaloshin has these results where you prescribe any sequence of growing as fast as you want. And he can find within a new house uh, open set. Uh, a generic set of diffeomorphisms so that along the subsequence you have growth faster than whatever you prescribe. So 
two to the two to the two to the seven tower ratio of growth, and uh, he can yeah produce that within the the new house yeah. So again, point one and three, it is diffeomorphism. Point two is for diffeomorphism or or uh, so the dimension one. So here you, you mean? Yes, I mean. Oh, this this is for deep memory cells. Yeah, we will see uh, dimension one. That's uh... okay. So I think Berger maybe stated his results for endomorphisms. Um, okay. I, yeah, maybe I, I prefer not to say. <laughs> maybe let's check. Actually, for the deep memory cells, you have to use one one contracting direction and you can do super endomorphism. Oh, if it is uh, expanding, so what's the question? So are you asking about this one? I'm asking if the system has uh, at least one contracting direction uh, statement, or uh, if, for example, the second is true also for endomorphism with four expanding direction. So I think for any any diffeomorphism that is uh, uniformly hyperbolic, so it should have at least one contracting yes, direction. Yes, but I, I, I don't know, maybe yeah, Felix, maybe so Felix. Right. Ones, one uh, right, so in dimension one is easier, we'll, we'll, okay. we will see a, a baby example of that. So, yeah. If one is a higher dimension, let's say, but at least one positive and one negative. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so there are different morphisms of uh, compact manifolds. As, uh, of class K, and that would imply in particular that there is an expanding, at least one expanding, and at least one contracting direction. All right. So th th this was the part that I didn't want to talk about. So. <laughs> okay, yeah, but that's good. So we can now focus on the one dimensional case where, I mean, after all of these results, that more or less the only tractable case in a way. Okay, so I wanted to, um, so instead of throwing theorems, I wanted to perhaps let's compute a concrete example so we can, and then we will, um, Extract some general principles from there. So let's suppose we have we have this very concrete polynomial with a complex. This is a complex polynomial. Just t to the power d, and this is seen as a map from the complex plane to the so let's compute the arcing matrix set of function of this very, very concrete rational map. Okay, so everyone knows. So just uh, all right. So this involves computing the number of fixed points of uh, P of n, and we can compute this when we have a formula. So there should be d to the n fixed points for this polynomial. And provided that the, all the roots are simple, that, that should be a, the exact number, right? Now, in this case, we can prove directly that the, there are, all the roots are simple, right? So if there were a double root, then um, it would, this polynomial would have a common root with its derivative. Derivate but, uh, my derivative. Uh, right, so we can factor it out. Minus one, yeah, minus one, yeah. So. <laughs> All right, so um, 
Well, skew is not a root, so we can forget about this factor. And also both. Yes, thank you. And these two equations are not so this being zero and that is zero are not compatible, so there are no common roots. All roots are simple. Excellent. So this implies that uh, that's exactly d to the n, the expected number. And when we plug in these in the or the makes of set of function, maybe it should indicate from a single degree. So inside here, uh, that's the expansion of minus log one minus df. So together with the exponential, we get that uh, rational function. So that's. Yeah, that's the problem with the. Sorry. Uh, one where sorry and n yes this is the number of fixed points so it is given minus one oh zero is fixed as well so there's the roots of this polynomial they're all simple so they're the n of n minus one yeah, so we have zero is also a fixed point. And ah, you the, zero. Yeah, all, all the fixed points. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay. okay, good, good. So um, that's the problem with doing a concrete example is make mistakes. So, okay. So hopefully that's correct. Um, and uh, actually, this is the what should happen in general, right? So unless the polynomial is special and it has a double or a multiple periodic points, that should be the um, its arcing maser set of function. So let's maybe yeah. You are considering only finite uh, infinity point. Uh, infinity is not really taken care of. Yeah, that's a good question. Yes. So we are looking at the action on the complex plane. So if we were to find to consider the action on the Riemann sphere, we would have an extra um, factor here, I believe, that comes from the fixed point. This is one minus s. So we, we should add a factor, uh, I think it's one over one minus s that accounts for the fixed point of infinity. Okay. All right, so, uh, so let's see what happens when you do have uh, multiple fixed points. Right? And the simplest example is perhaps a polynomial where zero is a fixed point, that's a double fixed point, all right? So in particular, uh, we know that there's just a single, fixed point, which is zero. But um, it's important to realize that this also affects the uh, number n sub n for every n, okay? Because um, n sub n is the number of fixed points of Pn, and zero will also be a double fixed point for all of those, okay? Uh, so, mm -hmm. so maybe an induction argument. So what we what I want to do is to compute the multiplicity. So what happens with the multiplicity at zero as we iterate the map? Okay. So an induction argument shows that when we expand. Um,
the nth iterate of p, we get, I think it's just n, n times u square plus i over n. Okay. So I'll let you do the computations. So this is an exercise as you iterate this uh, quadratic term, the coefficient uh, is exactly that. You can prove that by induction. And in particular, it's a non zero. That's what we want. So the multiplicity of zero as a fixed point of Pn is exactly two for every n. So the takeaway here is that the multiplicity. So this is one important fact. The other important fact is uh, Fatou's theorem. Okay. So Fatou's theorem says that this is in fact zero is the only multiple periodic point we can have, right? So every parabolic point should attract at least a critical one critical point. So if we had another multiple point, it would be a parabolic point, and it should attract a critical point. However, this is a quadratic map, and it only has one critical point, minus one half, and that's already attracted to zero. Okay. So but this theorem, <laughs> complex dynamics, but this theorem implies that um, zero is the only really point of multiplicity um, bigger than two. All right, so I think this is all we need to compute the artin maser set of function. Okay, so these two observations. So, um, So the number of fixed points of uh, Pn is going to be this expected number that we need to correct because there's a double fixed point at zero. So we need to subtract one, at least one. That's the first part of the, the first point. And the second point is uh, saying that basically that's all that we need to do. Right? So there are no further corrections. All the other uh, solutions are simple roots of the equation, so we have exactly e to the n minus one. Now, if you make the same equation, the, uh, this implies then that the arcing maser set of function is one minus s over one minus two s. So it's again a rational function. So, two is equal to d. Right. So we are in degree two, the quadratic polynomial. Oh, yes, sorry. Uh, so, yeah, B, B, as before, it was two. Uh, so maybe I, I leave it as an exercise to show that, in fact, for every rational map, the RT matrix set of function is always a rational function of S. For every polynomial, and if you want to consider the dynamics of a rational map on the Riemann sphere, you can also do it. So for every rational map, F, uh, the arcing matrix set of function, the rational function, Okay. 
test. And in general, uh, you have the, this is the expected number that you need to correct. And basically every parabolic orbit will give you a factor of this type. Uh, where you may, uh, you need to replace one here by the period. Well, no, it's not exactly the period, but by some power uh, that accounts for, it's the number of um, cycles of petals to be precise, okay? So uh, basically you have the expected number, the, the expected right, in major set of function and one factor per parabolic cycle. It's always a rational function. Yes, maybe it's a good moment to make a break. Uh, break or? No. Yeah. Okay. So what's <laughs> All right, okay. So yeah, I wanted to mention a couple of uh, open programs here. So basically you can always compute for a complex rational map. Um, you can always compute more or less explicitly the uh, Artin matrix set of function in terms of the finite data, so the number of parabolic cycles, and for each cycle, the number of uh, uh, cycles of petals. That's basically what you need, and you can then write explicitly what's the Artin matrix set of function, and in particular, it's a rational function. So. Um, then we know that the number of periodic points satisfies some linear recurrence relation and you have a closed formula for uh, finding exactly the number of periodic points of period F. So that's a, a nice uh, picture. So there are a couple of problems um, that I want to mention here. So one problem would be to uh, compute the uh, matrix set function of a, uh, a correspondent. So here we would have some, uh, say, compact remote surface. And instead of defining a function from the Riemann surface to itself, we can consider a um, curve. Maybe a reducible curve. In the product, and we can consider a multivalued map. So this is gamma. So we pretend this is the graph of a function. So given some point x, we can find usually more than one. Images. So we look at the intersection of this. Uh, yeah, I'm assuming perhaps this is not a vertical line or a horizontal line. Uh, and then we have a multivalued map in this one. So, so if we take a rational map, uh, we could consider the inverse of the rational map as a correspondence, where to every point we associate the pre images. The, Right, and uh, in principle, it's conceivable that maybe we can always have a um, the Artin Maser set of function is a um, rational function. Now there are several sources of motivation here. So there are the Hecke performances. Uh, this is the case where S is the limited here. And we can interpret S or at least well, minus infinity as the moduli space of elliptic curves, of complex elliptic curves. 
And we have the correspondence that maps an elliptic curve to uh, all the elliptic curves that are covered by E by a map of degree N. So this would be the correspondence of EN. Okay, so uh, it's a correspondence of degree TN. Uh, I well, I think the degree is sigma N. Um, and it, this has been thoroughly studied by, uh, so there's an equal distribution here and, and there are lots of properties known about this uh, correspondence. It's very important in number theory. And you may wonder uh, whether the artin major set of functions behaves as regularly as in the case of rational maps. Now, the main difficulty here is that, uh, to the best of my knowledge, there's nothing like uh, Fatou's theorem. So in principle, you may have, so there's an expected number of uh, periodic points of period N. So if, uh, the B degree here is B, B hat, is expected number of periodic points of period N is D to the N plus D hat to the N. Uh, however, it's conceivable that you may have infinitely many periodic points and then uh, the artin basis sort of function could be uh, transcendental. Yeah. So can you repeat how you define a periodic point for the correspondence? Right. So it would be any uh, point where you have a path that returns to itself. But these are elliptic curves that cover each other. So how can you, at the end, back to the same? Well, yeah. So you have the, so the periodic points for the Hecke correspondences are precisely the CM points. So point the elliptic curves that have a complex multiplication, right? So where, where you have basically it covers itself. It covers itself up to certain with a certain degree. Certain equivalence relation that the case of doing or something. Yeah, yeah. We're working on the moduli space of uh, on the moduli space. Exactly. Of I mean, curves. feature if you just look at covers, the elliptic way you cannot cover it. So. Okay, so uh, okay, so to be more precise, what I mean here is that there is an isogeny of degree. Okay. That's maybe what's bothering you. Yeah. Okay. So uh, okay, so we could loosely say that having an isogeny of degree and is covering with degree. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, yeah, another source of motivation here are these correspondences uh, studied by. Um, uh, Bullet, Penrose, and Lomonaco, where uh, these are makings of uh, SO2C, so the molar group, and uh, quadratic is not known. And at least in these cases, where given the precise uh, structure that they give. Um, so basically the limit set here is like a quadratic Julia set on one side that, and uh, so it's basically two quadratic Julia sets and you can compute exactly the, the number of periodic points. There is some version of a two theorem that applies. So you can in fact show that in this situation, uh, the artin major set of function is rational. So, so there is some support to the idea that uh, you may be able to uh, solve these problems. All right, the other problem that seems more, more difficult. What about the... Sorry? When you say there is some equidistribution, yeah. uh, you mean that you have uh, one measure circle in some sense distributing everything or maybe two measures? So uh, yeah, these are symmetric. So it's the same, it's the hyperbolic me uh, measure. So, so it, it's um, Duke, uh, then uh, Clausel Lulmo, the non prime case. Yeah, so every point will equidistribute to the hyperbolic measure. So when, when you look at this as, uh, as the complex plane, as the modular, uh, the, the moduli space of elliptic curves, um, it comes with its uh, hyperbolic measure 
So it's just the modular curve with its uh, natural hyperbolic measure. Yeah. All right, so the second problem is to uh, see what happens in positive trajectory. So, so is there any? <laughs> The reference map. Positive characteristic. And a rational uh, I can make it. So perhaps I'm really more precise than considering uh, reference maps that are defined over a finite field, say F2. And um, so it seem, seems to be that the tendency is that the rt matrix set of functions seems to be transcendental uh, in these cases. There's a theorem by Breedy. Uh, so he took the, uh, the special rational functions, say the lattice maps, the Chebyshev polynomials, and in positive characteristic, we also have these additive polynomials. And in all those situations where we can compute the number of periodic points more or less uh, precisely, uh, we have that the Artin Mesa set of function is transcendental. Now, it's pretty hard to uh, even guess what could be the answer for a rational map that is not transcendental, but I, I mean, perhaps based on, I mean, other situations, maybe non-dynamical situations, perhaps we could expect that the RT Mesa set function is always uh, transcendental. So I don't know, it's, a, it's an open problem. Um, so, so, so that again? Yeah, I mean, uh, anything that, um, so, so the, the trouble here is that uh, in, in a finite field, Every periodic point is parabolic. Okay, so so out of, out of the gates, you know that there will be the, so you have the the naive count, and there will be infinitely many corrections to make. Now it's conceivable that uh, they may cancel out, and you at the end of the day you get some rational function. But it's pretty hard, even so. So this computation we made here where you get n, well, in positive characteristic, when n is divisible by p, you get zero. So you, you have this vanishing, and it's uh, an art, really, to be able to compute the next non-zero term. It can be done. It's quite tricky, though. And it's, uh, yeah. I mean, for, for a given, for certain polynomials, in generic case, we know how to compute the sequence of multiplicities, but you give me a polynomial and I'm, I'm unable to compute the multiplicities for every really point. So that, that's what you need to compute the, I think, laser setup. So maybe there's another approach that's more successful. Uh, yeah, I think it's a, an interesting problem to, to consider uh, what happens in positive characteristics. And it's uh, somehow paradoxical, right, that the uh, all of this business started in positive characteristic, these big conjectures, and uh, this seems like a very difficult uh, case, right? All right, okay, so maybe let's move on. So this is the situation where we have a map that is algebraic, right? So we have rational map, polynomials, maybe correspondences. Um, so let's change topics and discuss the case of interval maps.
So what happens for interval mass? So again, I prefer to uh, consider a very concrete case. And from the analysis of this very concrete case, we will be able to perhaps you know, um, generalize the ideas to um, general set. So let's consider the golden mean that map. So number. The largest word so we will use a couple of times five squares five plus one and let's consider the map e from the unit interval to itself with the slope phi and minus phi. So let's see. Vex. Phi vex. And first half, just multiplication by phi. And we have this other formula, the second half. So that's the more or less the graph of the 10 map. Now, what's uh, important here is uh, the following. We have this turning point one half, and um, it turns out to be a periodic cycle of period three. So what happens? What happens? Map to phi over two. It's map to after small simplification. It's simpler to write phi minus one over two, and it comes back to one half. This periodic cycle. Really point of period three. Uh, this is zero, one. And if we consider these two intervals, so I not I one. We have a, a following dynamics. The left interval is mapped exactly to the interval on the right. And the right interval is mapped to the union of the two intervals. So we would find the union to be I have the interval is mapped into itself. Okay, an invariant interval. And in fact, well, okay, it's not difficult to see that if you start outside of I, the so called restricted inter <laughs> interval, if you start outside, then, uh, well, the map is expanding, and uh, if you start on the right, it will be mapped to the left, and on the left, it will turn to be, um, you'll get further away from zero as you iterate. So at some point, the orbit, unless you start exactly at zero, the point, the orbit will enter I. Okay. So, Take any point in the open unit interval outside of I, 
there is uh, some integer. So where this point will enter i. So in particular, there are no periodic points outside of i. So every periodic point different from zero, which is a fixed point. All right, now, um, this means that we can basically ignore what's outside of I, at least for the purposes of computing the Arting Maser set of function. And keep the dynamics on the interval i. So the RT matrix set of functions agree, except for this one fixed point that accounts for a factor of one over one minus s. Right? So if we compute. The Archimedes set of function for the restriction. We also have a formula for the Archimedes set of function of the original map. Now we can use this uh, observation here to relate the dynamics of P to the Fibonacci subject. So we can produce space of the symbolic dynamics here where. See there all sequences of um, zeros and ones, where we have one transition which is forbidden. We if we start at zero, we must move. So the next symbol must be equal to one. So this is the so-called Fibonacci subject. And uh, well, we basically have, uh, well, we, we also have the chief map. moves everything to the left, we forget the present, sorry, the future, one step in the future. Uh, and we have a, um, a commuter diagram, so there's a continuous function, semi-conjugacy, say pi, that goes from sigma to the interval i, that transforms the action of sigma of the shift map to the action of P on I. Okay. And uh, well, it so happens, I mean, this is almost one to one, except where, well, this is a counter set, this is an interval, so there's no way this is a homeomorphism. Um, so it's in some point, so it's um, the fibers, so there are two points that are mapped to the same point. This happens precisely at the pre-images of one path. Now, the pre none of these points is a periodic point. So, at least in this particular case, we know that the uh, number of periodic points agree. They, they have exactly the same number of periodic points. And uh, we can then compute the number of periodic points in many different ways, let me show you one, okay? So basically we can look at what well, pretty points, a pretty point for a fixed point for sigma n is a sequence which is periodic of period n. So we want to count the sequence, the periodic sequences 
in the Fibonacci subshift that have period F. Okay, uh, we can do this in many ways, as I said, but we do one of them. We can look at this uh, Markov uh, process. So we have two states, zero and one, and we have a pass, so we can go from zero to one. And if we're in one, we can either stay in one or go back to zero. And a periodic sequence of period n is exactly a path of length n that starts and ends in the same site. So we want to count the number of such paths. And you can do this by as follows. So you can define an example. So you fix some length n, some starting site i, some ending site j, and we can consider this number of paths of lengths and starting at i and and then at yeah. That way we can form the matrix. And the point of this is that you can just check that uh, we have, we can concatenate paths, right? This gives you, I mean, if you look at the, the different ways in, you, in which you can partition a path of length n plus m into a concatenation of a path of length n and a, a path of length m, you have exactly this relation where this is the matrix multiplication, okay? So from here, we see that we can compute exactly this number. We're looking forward for the, we're trying to compute the terms in the diagonal, the trace of this matrix. So, and so N sigma is exactly the trace of the data. And from this observation here, we can see that uh, these matrices are just the powers of the matrix A. So A here is A1, the matrix, the transition matrix 0, 1. Okay, and that's an exercise. So that's exactly, uh, it can be written exactly in terms of the Bonacci numbers. So the trace turns out to be for the number of previous points is exactly the Fibonacci number with index n minus one plus the Fibonacci number with index n plus one. And this turns out to be exactly phi n plus minus uh, phi to the power minus n. Okay. That's more or less a one way in which you can compute exactly this uh, number. So there may be a couple more computations. We get to the uh, formula for the Matrix set of functions given by that. So maybe I'll leave it as an exercise. So from from this formula here, from the fact that the number of fixed points of sigma n is exactly phi n plus minus phi n to the minus n, you plug in this into the formula of the Martin Mason set of function, and you can uh, get to this uh, to this formula. Again, a 
rational function of degree two Okay, so that's the concrete example, and I want to make a few observations that um, are true is somehow, somehow greater in general. So, may I ask? If yeah. See, the that you mean the best, the all the first your point is that the number of this point, which you, which I thought was our end goal, yeah. using this to compute the zeta function. Now the question is for what? Well, you have what you want. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So this is yet a concrete example, right? And where we can actually uh, compute the numbers exactly. Now, uh, for a more general interval map, um, yeah, I think you can say that it seems, even for some concrete examples I have in mind, it seems difficult to compute the exactly the number of fixed points of period f. However, from this concrete example, we can extract some general property, properties that are true in general. Okay, so this is just a concrete example to illustrate <laughs> this. Okay. Okay, good. So, so first we can see here that um, Say from this formula, you can see that the rate of growth is the limit for one over m log. So basically, this number, these numbers grow exponentially at the rate given by the golden. Line. And this is the uh, okay, the political entropy, right? And in more generality, so so for general for a general unimodal map, multimodal map, uh, we have this theorem by Misurevich and Schlenk that um, says precisely this. So the the number of periodic points, at least you assume, say, if we have a piecewise expanding map, okay, you say, uh, the number of periodic points grows exponentially at the rate given by the um, topological entropy. Uh, and we can see here that the um, the roots of this polynomial, or the poles of the anti mason set function, are precisely phi, the golden mean, and uh, its conjugate roots, so minus phi to the minus one. And this is also true in general. So, so here, phi, which is called the growth number, Um, this is also so one over five is the smallest square, is the smallest pole. Oh. This is the uh, so greater generality to the mystery of each. That's correct. The Milner extends. And you see here that uh, in this computation, what we really used was the fact that we have this Markov type structure. But this holds uh, whenever the turning point is pre periodic, right? So, whenever the turning point has a finite orbit, we can do a similar argument. Now, it's not going to be as concrete as in this case, but you could show that 
um, say you can read the maybe up to finally many corrections, you can read the number of six points of um, the nth iterate as a trace of a certain matrix. Yeah. Process for a, I mean, general search for finite time. I mean, you count uh, the number of combined points or counting these uh, entropy for a, you know, such a finite. Yeah, so yeah, you can do that for, for a general search of finite type. Yeah, you can. If I'm not mistaken, this uh, it's more or less the same type of idea where. You basically need to read the trace, even by the trace of the nth power of the transition matrix. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. The formula is like slope power n times. Uh, sorry? Yeah. It is the slope. Yeah. But it's the, so the growth number uh, here is also the slope. Yes. Up to sign, of course. All right, so what I want to uh, well, get from here is that maybe it's not a stretch to see that. Um, so if we have a 10 map. You know, it's a pin map. Uh, yeah, maybe it's slope lambda. Yes, you get a mic. Read it. Turning point. Yeah. Finite orbits. Uh, then the active maze of setup function is uh, rational. Okay, so the problem, so one of the problems I think open is to characterize those uh, interval maps. So let's say just to fix idea. So F, let's suppose F is a this way expanding interval map or perhaps a uh, map of class P3. Say, I want to include the quadratic family, for example, or uh, uh, say cubic polynomials. So maybe uh, we assume this of class B3, and we need this uh, regularity condition that I, I'm not going to expand too much on. So negative choice and derivative. All right, so let me perhaps just say here that if you have a polynomial, a real polynomial, where all of its critical points are real, this is automatically satisfied. So let's maybe not worry too much about that. It's just an extra regularity assumption. So that, uh, okay. So the problem is to um, so characterize, so when, um, but F has a, a rational uh, argument of set of So characterize those interval maps with a certain regularity just to avoid some trivial pathological stuff. 
um, for which interval maps the RT maser set a function is treasure. So these are some examples. So if you have a 10 map that has um, where the turning point has a finite orbit, uh, we know that the I think maser set of function is rational. Yeah. Is this if and orbit for the 10 map? For the 10 map, yes. So this does follow for 10 maps, this follows from the work. I think it's a state that without proof in Miller Thorson, no doubt, of course, they knew how to prove it. Um, they just didn't provide a proof. So if there is time, which maybe not. I'll sketch the proof of that, yeah. Uh, but um, as soon as you go uh, beyond the uh, unimodal setting, this is false, right? So there are bimodal maps where um, uh, with a rational artemisia sort of function that don't, uh, they're not post-critically finite or hyperbolic in some way. So maybe since I'm, I'm realizing I won't have much time, so let me throw out this conjecture. So conjecturing is uh, free, okay? So conjecture, the same F as before. So if F, F, the recurrent turning point, Then um, the active maximum set of functions is going to be. Ah, no, okay, no, maybe it's maybe too much. Not right. Okay. Yeah, actually, so. The reason for not saying that it's transcendental? Oh, oh it's just to be conservative. Uh, so for, for 10 maps, uh, you can actually show that. So, I mean, mainly from the work of Miller and Thurston, that the, um, you have a strong dichotomy. So either the turning point has a finite orbit, and in that case, the Artin Mesa sort of function is rational, or the um, acting maser set of function has the unit disk as a natural domain. Okay, in particular, it's transcendental. Okay, 10 minutes, all right. Okay, so I'll maybe um, state some of the results or at least some consequences of the results of Winner and Thurston. So consider a compact interval and a multimodal map. Means that this is a non-injective. This way is monotone map. So there is a, uh, you can write I as a union of finitely many intervals with these joint interiors where on each of these, these intervals, the map is uh, monotone. 
Okay. And requiring that, so this is just to say that there should be at least two uh, monotonicity intervals. Have L, the number of monotonicity intervals. Sometimes called the lab number. Okay. Right. And uh, well, uh, I mean, it's not difficult to see that if the sequence of, if you look at the lab numbers of the iterates of the map, they form a submultiplicative sequence. So the, it grows at a um, some definite exponential rate, and that's called the growth number. So in the case of um, a 10 map, this would be the basically the slope of the 10 map. All right, so this is the growth numbers. Okay, so one of the many, many consequences um, of the word of mirror and third side. So I have this uh, type of map, I'm not going to repeat, so F of C4. Um, right, so what we know is that the arcing maser set of function has a meromorphic extension. The unity sequence. Now, if the growth number is uh, bigger than one, then one over the growth number is the smallest pole of uh, this function. And it's also a simple post. All right, so one of the um, consequences of this fact, so if you somehow use the fact that you have this meromorphic extension beyond the pole, you can get gather some information about the growth of the periodic points. So in fact, you can show here that the uh, if you compare, so this is a refinement of the um, theorem of Misurevich and Schlenk, where uh, if you compare the number of six points of Fn to the end power of the growth number, this actually converges to one uh, exponential. So you can basically do some Cauchy estimate here using the extra space you have uh, to show that this uh, convergence is exponential. So it's not unlike what we had before, where, I mean, for this very concrete example, we had some dominant exponential growth plus some uh, exponentials that are smaller. So this, the same is happening here, 
except that there's no claim that there's a finitely many, that there are finitely many um, exponentials here. There's a dominant one plus the rest. So there's a definite gap between the growth of the main term with the compared to the rest. Okay, so that's a refinement of this uh, theorem by uh, Mr. Revit and Is there any regularity in substance? I'm assuming uh, we're like in here. Okay. So this why it's expanding back. So it should be continuous. Maybe hopefully set it somewhere. Yes, multimodal. Yeah. An injective. Yeah, continuous. Yeah, thank you. Definitely continuous. Um, plus some regularity to avoid some pathological uh, examples. All right, so. Okay, so maybe I'll just describe in words a few more things and then I'll make a, a summary of the remaining sessions. Okay, so uh, actually the, the work of Miller and Thurston is way more precise. They um, write, they, com they compute the Artemis associate function in terms of what they call the uh, needing discriminant, okay? And this is some algebraic object that I'm not going to define except in for unimodal maps, maybe tomorrow. Uh, but what's important here is that this needing discriminant is purely described in terms of the forward orbits of the turning points. Okay, so just by looking at the forward orbits of the um, critical points, you do some algebraic manipulations with that. So you build some power series and then you have some matrix, you compute the sort of determinant and bam, that gives you a series, which is essentially the inverse of the arcing measure set of function. In fact, more precisely, that needing determinant is almost exactly the Artemis set of function where you only count those periodic points that are of decreasing time, right? So where locally the map is uh, decreasing. Um, yeah, so that's the main result. And all of this, uh, so, so in particular, this needing discriminant has uh, integer coefficients that grow at most polynomially. So it converges on the unit disk and you can deduce then the metamorphic extension from there. Now in the uh, unimodal case, you can say way more. So it's a very, very concrete power series that allows you to prove the reverse implication here, essentially. Okay. All right, so the plan for tomorrow, so I, I wanted to finish with this today, but of course, uh, that's uh, unrealistic. So maybe tomorrow I will, um, Mention a bit more about the work of Miller and Thurston, especially in the case of unimodal maps, and round up the discussion on uh, around this problem, and in particular, uh, these results by uh, my student Jorge Olivares, that um, show that in fact uh, there are, you know, like. Could you mention one family of, uh, of polynomials with lots of bifurcations where uh, the Artin Maser set of function is uh, rational? So it's far from being PCF, but perhaps uh, we might ha be having some type of properties like that. So maybe, um, maybe the rationality forces some non recurrence. Uh, conditions, a weak form of non-uniform hypervelocity. Now, after that, uh, we will basically change gears and count, change the problem to count periodic orbit with weights, particular of geometric nature, and um, then the count is um, related to these prime orbit theorems that. Uh, 
So the, the rest of the mini course will be about that uh, topic. All right, thank you. So, so okay, how does this uh, example of rational argumental function of the big say? Is it your student, or was there some some other example? So I learned it from my student, definitely. I um, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Say Milner certainly probably I know about it. Yeah, yeah. So they have a phrase actually. I thought they they had it. Uh, the, I looked for you know the <laughs> salon paper, and I thought they didn't even uh, consider it. But my student actually found uh, a line where they, they mentioned this. It's a uh, part, and um, yeah. So what's interesting here, so uh, I'll explain tomorrow, is, is that in fact it's as worse as you can. So you can. It seems to be that uh, one of the critical points has to have some restriction, but the other ones can have uh, arbitrary behavior. I mean, the, so know, there is no post-critical orbit relation or something. No, they're, they're completely free and they bifurcate independently, right? So you have a dimension one family where all the critical points behave independently with bifurcations, and there is this single cycle that is tied, it's periodic, uh, this, this single turning point, yeah. That's, it's interesting. I mean, you need to use uh, Thurston's theorem and this transversality results of uh, uh, Lenin, Chen, and the string. Yeah. <laughs>